In this presentation, we will explore the anatomy and operation of the rotating anode X-ray tube. X-ray tubes started life with stationary anodes that didn't have much mass. Here is a picture of one of the first stationary anode Coolidge hot cathode X-ray tubes marketed by General Electric in the mid-1920s. I will highlight the anode in green. Notice that it is a slender affair without much, without much mass. While it is a big improvement over previous Crookes tubes, early Coolidge hot cathode tubes could not handle large MA stations or small exposure times without melting or pitting. Early radiographers would use charts to determine whether a particular technique would damage an anode before making an exposure. As radiographers became used to Coolidge hot cathode X-ray tubes, they began to ask for smaller focal spots to improve detail, larger MA stations, and shorter exposure times to reduce patient motion. Manufacturers responded to this need by fashioning anodes from large copper bars, increasing the anode's ability to absorb and store the heat of exposure. I will highlight the anode of this X-ray tube in green. Notice that it is comprised of a large copper bar that has a tungsten button, a target, embedded in its face. In the end, this solution was still not good enough. Focal spots were still too large and exposure times too long to meet our needs. In 1929, the first rotating anode X-ray tube was marketed by Philips of Holland. While other manufacturers adopted this innovation, rotating anode X-ray tubes didn't gain wide acceptance until the early 1950s. The anode is now a large tungsten rhenium molybdenum disc that is beveled on its face. I'll highlight this in green. Furthermore, the disc is bolted onto a ball bearing structure called the rotor. While it is not illustrated here, there is a large copper coil that surrounds the rotor. The rotor and coil form the two halves of an induction motor. Early radiographers had to be concerned about how much heat a given technique would generate and how much heat an anode could store before heat would cause damage. The tube rating chart was used to answer the question, Will this exposure melt, pit, exposure melt, pit, or otherwise damage the target? This chart was consulted before any new technical combinations were attempted. In the late 1950s and early 60s, these charts became unnecessary when automatic circuitry was developed that would prevent overloading the X-ray tube. The anode cooling chart has a different purpose. It is concerned with the ability of the anode to safely store the heat of multiple exposures and is necessary to consider where rapid successive exposures are performed. This is normally only a problem for special procedures technologists, technologists who might rapidly produce five or more exposures very quickly. Here is a diagrammatic representation of a stationary anode X-ray tube. The anode is comprised of a large copper bar designed to store and move heat from the target to the cooling oil surrounding the tube. The target is where the X-rays are produced high energy stream of electrons. The target can withstand the extreme heat that is a byproduct of X-ray production without damage. Even though the target can handle high stress of heat, it is possible to damage the target with high MA short time exposures. This is a diagram of a rotating anode X-ray tube. Notice how the cathode and focusing cup are offset and aimed at the outer bevel portion of the anode disc. The anode and target are combined into a disc comprised of a tungsten rhenium track on a molybdenum core. 
Since the heat of X-ray production is spread over a large area of the anode disk, it doesn't need to be a massive structure as in the stationary anode X-ray tube. The rotor forms half of an induction motor. A magnetic field is rotated around the periphery of the rotor causing it to spin within the tube. There is no physical connection between the windings and the rotor. Force to rotate the rotor is transmitted by magnetic fields through the Pyrex glass envelope. These represent copper coils wound around the neck of the tube. They are wound in a manner so that when connected to an alternating current source, they produce a rotating magnetic field around the neck of the tube. Here is a side and end view of a tube rotor and anode disc. The focal spot is indicated by the gray rectangle at the bottom of the anode disc. During an exposure, the anode disc rotates beneath the electron stream. This spreads the heat of exposure over a large surface of the anode disc instead of leaving all the heat concentrated at the point of the focal spot, as in a stationary anode tube. Here's an enlarged view of the anode disc. Again, the disc rotates during the exposure. This causes the heat to be spread over a very large area that is called the focal track. Since the heat is spread over a large area, small focal spot, high MA exposures are possible. Higher MA exposure levels equate to faster exposure times and less possibility of patient motion during the exposure. The pros and cons of rotating anode X-ray tubes are MA stations greater than 100 MA allow exposure times to decrease below one second. Most modern X-ray machines are capable of MA levels as high as 800 MA and exposure, and exposure times as fast as 1 1,000th 1, of a second. Of course, all this added technology comes at a cost. Rotating anode X-ray tubes are more costly than stationary anode X-ray tubes. With complexity becomes less reliable and increased possibility for failure. Rotor bearings and circuits can fail, leading to expensive replacement and repairs. The first thing a radiographer is trained to do is to wait for the rotor to reach speed before pushing the exposure switch. This complicates exposure at a precise time more difficult, such as when synchronizing exposure to the inspiration of a chest X-ray on an uncooperative infant. Normally, the rotor spins at 3,000 revolutions per minute. This speed equals 50 revolutions per second, allows exposure times that are fast enough for most radiography, where the patient can cooperate during the exam. A simple way to increase heat capacity for even faster exposures is to spin the rotor faster, so some X-ray machines offer high-speed rotor options. Selection of, selection of the high-speed rotor is often tied automatically to higher, 600 and above, MA stations. The most obvious indication a high-speed rotor option is in play is that the rotor will make a higher-pitched sound when activated. The use of high-speed rotor, rotor has little to no effect on patient care or the final image quality. Finally, the rotor disc is faced with tungsten rhenium alloy over a molybdenum core, instead of the copper bar and the tungsten insert seen in stationary anode X-ray tubes. Thank you for your attention. This has been the Rotating Anode Presentation.